This Talking Flutes podcast is kindly sponsored by Trevor James Flutes, making life sound beautiful. You can show them some flute love by following them on Instagram at TJ Flutes, Trevor James Flutes on Facebook and at trevorjamesflutes.com. Hello there and welcome this week to a very special Talking Flutes Extra podcast with me, Jean-Paul Wright. Before we delve into it, I'd like to thank you for sending in your flute questions and subject matter for future pods. We are only here at podcast number 181, yes, 181, because you, our listeners, continue to give us ideas to actually speak about. Please continue to like, rate and comment on the Talking Flutes podcast channel you are listening to us on. It really helps those pesky algorithms and other people to actually find us. So back to this week, and why is this podcast so special? Well, if I tell you that my guest this week is a genuine scientist, composer, researcher, flute player and public speaker, then you might just understand that this is going to be really, really interesting. Not being a scientist myself, actually, I'm as far away from being a scientist as I am being a spaceman, an astronaut. I first came across Dr. Domenico Vincinanza on social media. We gradually began to chat about things fluty, and I read about some compositions he'd done with US flute player and educator Dr. Alicia Schwartz, and became fascinated at the breadth of his work, interests and expertise. And to cap it off, he also plays the instrument. So a little bit about Domenico. He has an MSc and PhD degree in physics and worked for seven years as a scientific associate at CERN, the European Organisation for Nuclear Research, one of the world's largest and most respected centres for scientific research. The next bit is where my brain fogs over a bit. However, it's important to understand some of his scientific work before we talk flutes and dig down a bit on his compositions. His research at CERN mainly focused on the development of an innovative time-of-flight detector for one of the biggest high-energy physics experiments for the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva. The detector design was based on multi-gap resistive plate chambers, MRPC for short, reaching a sensitivity of 70 picoseconds, the highest ever reached, and its use in a large-scale experiment marked an important milestone for particle physics. Right, now back to my language. As a music composer and researcher in auditory display, Domenico worked with organisations like CERN and NASA, creating music from scientific data. This is really interesting. He has been involved in the application of grid technology for science and the arts since the late 1990s, chairing the ASTRA, which is the Ancient Instrument Sound and Tombra Reconstruction Application, project for the reconstruction of musical instruments, by means of computer models using the European grid infrastructure. Are you still with me? I hope so. Domenico's research has been featured on several international peer review magazines, and he's been interviewed for many, many, many uh, TV, radio and magazines, amongst others, Financial Times, The Guardian, The Times, BBC, CNN, Discovery Channel, Discovery Magazine, New Scientists and Scientific America. I'm therefore excited and delighted to welcome this wonderfully clever, but more importantly, lovely gentleman to Talking Flutes Extra. Hello, Dom. Hello, good morning, Uh, How are you this morning? In fact, how's lovely Cambridge? Oh, um, I'm very well, thank you very much. Lovely Cambridge is a little bit cloudy this morning. For those who haven't, haven't had the opportunity ever to go to Cambridge, it is the most beautiful of cities, full of very old buildings, sort of college buildings, and it's a very small city, but it is just the most gorgeous place just to visit. Yeah, it's, 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 it's very green. It's very compact. I like the fact it's very compact. You can walk everywhere. Yes, you can. Which is, which is brilliant. And you can take a boat on the river. Yes, you can punt, of course. So you can cycle <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> you, can, you can. So, Dom, what a privilege it is for me to finally catch up with you. Um, but before oh, we you. delve into your amazing compositions... And the process of how you actually create them. Let's go back to the beginning. Where did this love for science first start? When, when I was a little child, I had this, this dream of being uh, being an artist. I, I, I like 
being creative, I like mostly messing up with with things like paint. I like the sound of the of the paint on my on my finger, the squeaky sound of the of the acrylic or the gouache. I, I like I, I just having a having a physical feeling of of creating something uh, by 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 combining things together. And uh, uh, so I had this idea in my mind. So I would like to be an artist. But I was also very curious about what was happening around me, and I was curious about what's so why things are that way, why the sky is blue, the, the, the usual stuff. And I, I was always fascinated by reason behind behind things and how nature is wonderful. And and uh, I, there was a lot of pressure for to like just pick one. You want to be an artist, or you want to be scientist and say why do i have to pick one and uh and the, you know with with Thai, i noticed that nature is a, is a wonderful reminder that you almost can't have one without the other you just can't have you can't just enjoy the the beauty of nature if you if you don't ask questions about why things are in a certain way and you can't really appreciate art i i think without uh, and a little bit of inquisitive spirit that's coming from science. So I, I think that the two, the two words have to be together. So I, I I tried not to pick one, and I, I made that one of my my life and career. I, I always still want to be an artist and a scientist. So my my life, you know, in some way, alternated between uh, uh, like scientific studies, then music studies, then a bit more science, then a bit of music, and eventually I came to the point where I, where I'm now, where I'm working in this very interesting like crossroad between between art and technology, where I I'm using technology to make art, to facilitate art, uh, but I'm also uh, very much looking at science from a musician's point of view. I'm looking at uh, at the scientific phenomena and I'm looking for harmonies, or I'm looking for rhythms, I'm looking for patterns, I'm looking for what us as musicians are used to used to do, and we do very very well. What's really interesting is that you've grown up with the the preference probably for the audible use of your sort of one of your senses. That's sort of been the the big thing for you because everything, as you said, you started with the the squelching of the paint. So everything in nature makes a sound, doesn't it? Yes. And the the earring sense is is the only one we cannot switch off. Even (laughs) if we are are asleep, our earring is is still active because it, it, it will trigger a start response or wake up wake us up if there is any if we need to run because there is a danger so it's the only sense we can really switch off apparently so that's what they that's, that's what they right. and that, that fascinates me like we, we are not using that enough well in particularly in science we don't use earring very very much or as often as we we should i think not compared to animals where hearing is a very important no. part of, well their life really and and the sense of smell but there is data I mean, we're going to go into the realms of uh, an area that I don't really understand, but sound can be correlated to a number or some form of data, can't it? Just like a smell can. So if, for example, does a flower, when it opens, can you draw data from an opening flower? Of course you can. You can do, like, <laughs> lo- there's lots, lots of data you can do. Uh, you, you can get from, from an opening flower. You can, uh, uh, well, first of all, you, you can take a... Uh, you can use the camera, or you, you you can do like a like a video of that. You can speed it up. You can you, you can just take a position of a of a point of a of a petal. Let's imagine you you draw a little point on a, on on a petal of, of the flower, and then you track the opening, so the movement of that point it will it will draw like a little arch. And imagine you can take that little arch. So so that is data, of course. What you can do with that data. Well, I'm, as a musician, what I would do is taking that arch, put it on, on, a, on an empty save and try to play it. How do you choose which note? In other words, if you have an arc, where's the starting point and where's the apex? And then is that sort of down to the artistic part of you? And uh, you, you're touching on it on a really, really interesting point. So, yeah, there, there, is, there, is the, there is an artistic choice to make. What scale I, I use, how, how narrow or how bro or how, how coarse or how fine grained is my is my quantization so uh, how many notes do I fit there I have an arch there and uh, and and my arc is, is for example of a certain length and I can fit there three notes or 45 notes mm. 
And uh, and of course, that partly depends on, on your artistic choice. Uh, of course, depends on the rhythm, depends on the... That also depends on what kind of message or what kind of characteristics of the data you want to highlight. And that is not different from any kind of visualization. When you are... Imagine you want to, to draw a graph, like you want to do a plot of that data on a piece of paper. There is the same amount of ambiguity, of the same amount of of choices to be made. Like a scientist has to decide, okay, what's the scale? Uh, how big on our how uh, how much you know how much I want to allow? Do I use a linear scale, log- a logarithmic scale? Uh, do I use do I filter this data? Do I? There is a lot of processing that happens behind the scenes. So every time we see we see a graph, we think that is a faithful representation of the of the that phenomena of that. But that is actually filtered by the eyes and the and the experience of of the scientists who took the data and. Uh, that's, that's, uh, my dog, that's my dog barking now. It's brilliant, it's brilliant. <laughs> we took the data and decided to highlight certain characteristics uh, of it. So th- the same kind of, of freedom, which is beautiful in science because it allows different scientists to see different things in data, is what inspires different musicians to see different things in the same phenomena, in the same data collected so it all comes back even though you have the data so you have the basic pattern of notes that you can utilize and you have a big a large spectrum of scope within that analysis but it comes down to your own as you say visualization i mean we'll play an excerpt later of some work that you've done with uh, yellowstone geezers so for example one of them is mud pots so mm. if you could see a mud pot, so you would get, I'd imagine as a composer, you'd get sort of quite deep, in, deeply involved in the data and understanding the visually what the mud pots do. But you would look at it very differently to another scientist composer. So you'd both come up with very, even though you'd start with the same data, the sounds I'd imagine and what it looks like, the compositions could be based around what you actually see and feel rather than necessarily the use of the data? Or is it a combination of both? I think it's a combination of both. That's, that's, a, that's a very, very good point. And I think that's, that's why I'm so fascinated by the, uh, by the idea of working, working with, with data is because the phenomenon is, is captured there or at least there's certain characteristics. So if I'm using a, I, I normally work with infrasonic microphones. So I'm using these sensors that are able to capture what we cannot hear. Uh, all the rumbling, all the low frequency movement vibrations, the the breathing of the earth, of the of the movement of the wind, all these kind of things that we that we don't we cannot perceive with our ears, but they are there in some way. They f- they they are the foundation or the basis for the things that we see and that the things that we we observe and we and we perceive. So I have my infrasonic microphones. I I plug them in the ground. Uh, and I, and I, get the, I get the vibrations, and in particular things like volcanoes or, or, or earthquakes, or in this case, mud pots, you can actually capture quite a lot of the, uh, of the actual vibrations and the, and the process of the, of the bubble, the, uh, of uh, the mud bubble creating and then bursting and then, and then the mud falling again in the, in the mud pot and this cyclic thing going on and on and on. And of course, as a musician, I was captured by the by that rhythm, this bubble uh, becoming bigger and bigger, then bursting, falling down, and then another bubble is created. And there is this wonderful, always different, but this wonderful regularity in uh, in this process that is keeping on, going on and on and on. And I, I want to capture that, and I was to... So I was looking in particular, I'm getting the data, I was looking for micro patterns, I was looking for global shapes, and I was looking for this way, how the burst happens and how quickly it happens, how the, the burst is different from the quiet. So I was looking at the different uh, dynamics or the different kind of behavior changes in the, uh, in, in the mud. Another musician or another scientist might be interested in, for example, completely different ha- characteristics. How many bumbles are ca- happening at the same time? Or what is the frequency? Uh, what is the global density of the bubbles? It's a completely different study. Same data, same de- detectors, completely different study, maybe completely different music. So when you're seeing the data coming through, do you hear sounds or do you just see data? Do you start, Do you think in, in compositional form 
or are you looking at the data and then you start the creative process? Sometimes it is. I look at the data and I can I can think about the sound because you can clearly see shapes that are very musical. You can see the almost a melody developing there, going up and down, uh, or having in very interesting jumps or very interesting patterns that you can you can feel that they they work very well musically. Other times, you have to do a little bit of work on it. Like, okay, I can see there's something very interesting going on here. I can't really see yet what how that would sound like. So I need a little bit of filtering and processing. And that, so I'm, I'm using data science in that case uh, and some data science techniques to, uh, to actually do some very clever filtering. Say, okay, how I can actually identify, is there any micro pattern I can identify? Is there any, any way to, uh, to get the signal? Is there a noise? Is there, you know, we can, can can we talk about the noise here? Is noise actually noise, or is something structured, <laughs> but in a very different way? And uh, so, how much of that I want to filter out? So, interestingly, for this mud for this mud pot, where I was fascinated by the this the shape of the of the signal, like this burst, this regular burst, uh, and then I, so I tried to to map that, choose a scale, choose a like a, a rhythm. Uh, and then almost faithfully tries the uh, the shape of the of the of the mud pot bursting in uh, on a score. Shall we take a listen to an excerpt played by the wonderful, the wonderful Dr. Alicia Schwartz, and what a beautiful flute player she is, of mud pots written by your good self using data from the Yellowstone geezers. Thank you. Do you know, that was absolutely stunning. But wow, you know, I was, I was with the mud pot. I could see the bubbles. I could see the little explosions. Knowing that, that was, you've had some microphones in the ground and you were, you, you've written that based on the data, it was talking to you. So in effect, the mud pot was talking to you and you've written something to reply back. <laughs> 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 wonderful, wonderful. Oh, th- thank you very much. Thank you. I'm really glad you liked it. I did. And you're writing music for th- us as human beings. Our, you know, some people have really good hearing. Some don't have a sort of a narrow spectrum of hearing. Uh, and sort of the animal kingdom, you know, a- again, it varies from a wide expanse of uh, hearing ability to a, a lesser experience. I, I'd imagine we've all the animals have evolved to have hearing that's commensurate with their survival. But you're bringing sort of the invisible to us, to reality. Do you have this type of fascination of that? <laughs> Thank you. I, I, that, that's, that, that's exactly how we see it. And, uh, and interestingly, it almost started by, by chance. Uh, I was approached by a group of geologists. I discovered they are using infrasonic measurements all the time. It's their way of, uh, of having like high quality seismographs. So instead of just using the, the usual needle that we see on a piece of paper, more sophisticated seismographs are actually based on uh, infrasonic measurements. So they actually uh, have this these microphones on a tripod. They are on the volcano and they get these measurements all the time. They, they are infrasonic, and they they, you know, they ask me, you know, can you help us make sense of this? Can you can you find a different way of communicating, representing, understanding this? And that was my first time actually uh, started working with infrasonic data. I had no idea how much there was there, how rich these things were. And uh, and they were, if you look at the spectrum, the peak is around 30 hertz, just barely audible. This is the rumbling of the volcano that we see. But there is a, a huge part of the signal that is completely inaudible. We can feel it with our body. If you can put a hand on a volcano or if you put your ear 
the a gigantic ear on this on the surface of the volcano. You can see, you can hear the harmonics of that rumbling. But there is so much that is in some way hidden to our senses because we cannot perceive the uh, the actual physical movement of the volcano. But there is a lot. If you imagine the volcano as a music instrument, you can see this, this huge mass that has one or more holes inside where the, where the lava is going through that vibrates. And, uh, and of course, the, vib the vibrations depend on the size, on the shape. Uh, if there is part of the volcano that is underwater, for example, as the first volcano I was working with, the Mount Etna, uh, has like 3,000 meters underwater. So it's a, a huge, massive, resonating object. And I like to think that as a music instrument, a very strange one, very odd one to work with. But because of its size, of course, the, the frequencies are is like a very, like, sub 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 contrabass instrument and um as so i was fascinated by okay how i can actually make music out of it and so i started working on uh, on on processes to filter out of the like rumbling noise some regularities and patterns and uh, and trying to to bring the inaudible to the uh, to the human perceivable domain where we can actually hear something uh, and my personal way was trying to uh trying to draw to use these vibrations to actually create melodies that were following exactly the same rumbling. So we can actually, having a guided tour, audio tour, how the shape was changing. And maybe that was also, could, let's say, lead the way to new ways of predicting eruptions, like when the melody starts changing in a certain way. But I'd imagine most of us listening to this podcast view volcanoes as a really strong, violent entity that litter the planet and can you find beauty in composing using volcano data? Or is it, is it like Gustav Holt's Mars, you know, Jupiter? Is it, is, can you find sort of pure sort of harmonic beauty in amongst this deep, deep tonal mass? I think definitely yes. What I feel is that nature is always so interesting and rich and wonderful. Uh, sometimes even in this ext very extreme manifestation or e events, that deserves careful attention and careful listening. And yes, there is a lot of very dramatic, sometimes dangerous, terrible consequences that are related to, to an eruption. But it's also something that is part of the of the our planet living and breathing, and uh, and it's something that we, we we have to in some way deal with. And the the reason why I think there is there is beauty in that, or as there is beauty in winds on Mars, and is because it's part of something that is so wonderfully interesting and complex and, and something that they, that deserves our attention in uh, in some way and i'm particularly fascinated when the when the beauty is he's hidden and you have to work to bring it out it's not there it's not obvious uh, it's not just in front of you like you know you, you look at the sunset that's beautiful and it, it's a, just spoiled for choice about how you can render that is it like michelangelo who, Indeed, who exactly. Worked, I was thinking yeah, exactly that. Yeah, he said that he doesn't he doesn't create anything. It's actually inside that marble. He just exactly. Yeah, to give it out. Yeah. exactly. And a lot of the data science technique I use are exactly like filtering. Very very smart, very clever, very sophisticated filtering techniques. It's about how I can actually get that thing that is inside the rock or inside the volcano. How I can actually bring that little regular thing or that little uh, interesting pattern that it, it is there and it, it has to be there. And, uh, and every single phenomenon happening in nature, I, I believe, has to have something that deserves to be, to be listened to. It's just how our, our job as scientists and, and musicians to bring it out and communicate it to the others. It's just wonderful seeing a scientist getting just excited at data and the use of data. <laughs> should, we listen to, should we listen to another excerpt, Dom? And again, oh, yes, this is taken me. from the, the same suite of uh, pieces and again played by Alyssa Schwartz. And it's called Fumaroles or Fumaroles? Fumaroles? Yes. What is a fumarole? They're like, like, like little, uh, little geysers, geysers or geysers. Uh, they are not exploding. They are just like a, like a vent where, they are, when there, is bur where there, is, there is steam coming out regularly. So there are cracks in, uh, on the surface of the earth and, and there is like steam or smoke coming through. So there is quite a range of regular phenomena happening there. So no big bursts or explosions. So the challenge there is finding, okay, what do we represent in, uh, in, uh, in, in the music and what characteristics of that we want to communicate? <laughs> Let's take a listen and we can all hear. Yes. Thank you. 
oh wow, I got it. You have to you have to know the backstory, and you gave that perfectly before we listened to that. But yeah, I got it. I I, I got it, and I could visualize that. Obviously, I've been to Iceland. A lot of people have been to Iceland, and you see the big exploding geysers. Um, but to see these sort of little, to visualize these little tiny ones that don't explode, they, do they sort of come up like a little fountain, then go back down again? Exactly, and it's very different from the from the from the mud pot ones, so you, where you can <laughs> clear, you, you can you can probably hear the burst, and you can see how the music is following the burst. The fumarole is, is something you, you can see the, the, the build up in the process, and there is a, like this continuous flow. That was the idea: is the continuous flow. That what is what I probably I hope people could could hear from the uh, from this sonification, this translation into music of the of the data. So you composed this music. You sent it over to Elisa because you're seeing the data and you've written that based on the data and your creativity. How do you get a musician? to come close to what you're feeling on the composition that is uh we had a lot of conversations <laughs> yes yeah, there was there was a lot of talking with uh, with with the least about uh about what to render what's the message what's to communicate how uh how use um uh, rhythms, dynamics uh how use all the beautiful characteristics of the flute and i of course well as a flutist, I love the flute, of course. Uh, but th- th- there is also something very special about the flute that uh, because you have a, a l- more limited range compared to, let's say, you have three octaves. Uh, on a piano, you have much more. Uh, on a, even on a clarinet, you got more. There is there is a there is a very interesting work you have to do in making sure that you are uh, guiding the listener to the tessitura, the uh, the uh, dynamics, the articulation of that particular instrument. Uh, to communicate the uh, to communicate the message is having the having having three octaves in some way simplifies the the work that the listener has to do to take on board and uh, uh, and absorb the message. If you're using an orchestra, you almost have too much choice. Yeah, you have a huge range, and you have this uh, this message to communicate. That, you know, for me, it was like the, this bubble bursting. And you have an orchestra, and and of course you have low. You have from the from the percussions, you have the low frequencies from the double basses, and uh, and the low uh, brasses, and the low woodwinds, and then you have up to the, uh, the violins and the and of course flute piccolo. So you have you have the, the whole range, and everything is contributing to create this beautiful or this very powerful. Ma- I want something very different, something almost on the other side of the spectrum, very intimate. I want to, music almost talking to one uh one single person in a very nice very intimate like almost telling a story in a very personal way and i thought an orchestra cannot do that are you simplifying nature by using the flute which is really the voice isn't it are you sort of simplifying for the benefit of the audience the simplicity of the action or the data that you've received in some in some sense yes in in the sense that I, i'm like distilling and taking what is essential and having the flute as as a very effective way to be an intimate communicator. A smaller range of dynamics compared to a brass or compared to, let's say, a, 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 like string instruments. There is a limited uh, range of, of frequency. You have three octaves to, to, to essentially to play with, or two and a half, you know, where you, you can actually play very, very effectively. So it's a very more... It's, it's more intimate. It's more, more like, like a person talking to another person. Yeah, it's very understandable as well because you're using a flute and the notes on the flute. You're not using quarter tones or half tones. It's understandable and relatable. Oh, thank you very much. That, 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 was, that, was, my, that, that was the idea, is to be relatable. Like, nature has to be relatable. Nature is talking to us and, uh, and, and, and we, it's very difficult sometimes to listen because they, they, we, we don't speak the same language. Or because nature's language is in a in a range of you see, see let's say vocabulary that we don't understand. If it speaks like ten hertz, and we don't we don't have the the detectors to get to, to get that. It's like we don't have the vocabulary to get that that kind of frequency or that kind of information. So I, I, I like I like to use flutes as a very very powerful way, but very intimate way to uh, to communicate that and to and, and to reach us. And it works because, as I said, it's a voice really to make a sound on the flute. You're using air. 
So you're using breath. You're not using a string, a mouthpiece, or hitting anything. So the purity of that comes over wonderfully. Oh, thank you. And I, I, li- I like the idea that fumaroles and, uh, and geysers and uh, mud pots are created by, by flow of air, of steam. And that is very similar. You don't have, you don't have read, you don't have a- any mediation. It's pure, it's pure stream of air and the resonating body of the flute, exactly as, as the, the fumarole or the mud pot or uh, just air that is going through the, a different material like the mud or the, or the rock and creating sound. So I, I thought it was, what it was a very, very close connection between the two. And let's look at this, let's look at music. I know people think of data as being numbers, but when you're playing a musical instrument, you're playing a, a blob on a piece of paper, but that's data, that is a note, that is a data. But within that note, there's lots of variables, whether you're playing in tune, out of tune, but also the different sort of, the, the different variations of sound everything in life is data so in effect when you go to a concert or you're listening to classical music rock music rap or whatever it is actually at its raw form simply data that is so true and that's why hearing is such something so incredible uh, and when, when, when i talk to, to students where, where, I, where i where i have to the opportunity to talk about you know why why hearing is so important if you're looking at a is something around us. We are limited by three dimensions. We, we, we can only perceive three dimensions. Things have have three dimensions around us and we are limited by that. So we are limited by th- three independent streams of information that we can perceive by our, with our, our eyes. We have almost no limitations when it comes to hearing. You know, imagine like you, uh, you have a string quartet or you have a pop band or you have an orchestra and your brain can tune in and can listen selectively to the flute that is playing a solo, or to double bass, or to the, or to the drum, that kind of filtering, like getting the the entire picture if you want, like the entire band playing at me, or having the possibility of isolating the single stream, like now I want to hear, listen to the guitar, and I want to listen to the to, to the singer or to or to, the bass, to the bass player, is something we can easily do automatically do with the earring, but we can, there is nothing like that we can do with with with, with vision and we. That's fascinating. It's beautiful. It is. I, you know, it's what's really interesting for scientists to say that is that I teach people how to do mindful listening, which is to take mm. music, a composition, uh, whether it be pop or classical, and follow one line, one instrument, but just follow it and don't because as a as a well as humans we listen to things in the round, don't we, in the whole, and sometimes the beauty is to take to delve within the structure of the composition and what you're listening to and just to find the little parts and then to move around the score and it's it's just amazing how mindful you become that's so true i completely completely agree with you it is it's it's also the bane of flute players lives because as playing in tune is uh well what is playing in tune because it depends who you're playing with doesn't it and uh, as you say, get three piccolos pl- tra- playing unison up up top, third octave. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> been, been, been there. No. <laughs> Can we take you back to your pre-Cambridge days? No, yes. Now you're lecturing in Cambridge. Your time at CERN. Now, I have this vision of what scientists would speak about over dinner in a restaurant. Science. But what re- what, what's it really like existing in a world of highly intelligent people at CERN? Did you have a party? Do you have parties? Do you get drunk? Do you <laughs> yeah. do you dance? What what do you do as scientists in this most amazing place? Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> very very interesting. Uh, well. I think a very good scientist is, is somebody who has a lot of interest and, and, and lots of hobbies and lots of, is passionate about so many things. Because what, what all scientists have in common is curiosity, is this inquisitive spirit about trying to get all under the surface, understanding why things are where they are. One of the things that I, I was very, very surprised to see at CERN when I, when I started working there was the amount of different clubs that were there. The photo, the photo club, the dancing club, the choir club, the fly fishing club, the ski club. The, there were like <laughs> fifty plus different clubs, and uh, and just because people have lots of lots of other interests other than than science. So uh, I had such a wonderful time skiing on a weekend with the ski club, and then singing in the in the in the choir, and then this music club, the classic mu- the pop music, the rock music club. We had concerts every uh, uh, every week. We have a, a Steinway grand piano in the auditorium. We had a 
uh, we had a, a harpsichord that was wheeling in and out of the auditorium where people, where scientists were giving like science talk and where the Higgs boson was, was announced in 2012. Uh, and that is also, con- where it was our, also our concert place. And I, and I was invited like two, two, uh, two years ago to organize a concert there, entirely a music coming from science. Uh, and it was it was wonderful to see people that are talking about Beethoven's quartet, late string quartet, and then Higgs boson, and then talking about uh, photography, and then all at the same time, same dinner. And this, this huge variety of interests is probably what what makes science so special, I think. Well, the actual discovery of the Higgs boson, which before it was discovered at CERN, was a theory, wasn't it, that of its existence. For it to be actually found and located... And then for you to then turn that (laughs) into music, a compositional Uh, score, I mean, it's all strange, it's weird, it's exciting, it's fascinating, it's data. (laughs) And it's very artistic. And yes. uh, in some in, in some way, uh, the, the the Higgs boson was theorized was part of a, of a model that was invented in 1964, and it was the probably the only occasion where a Nobel Prize was awarded to the scientists who created this model called the standard model uh, before it was actually verified <laughs> because it was so beautiful. <laughs> Essentially, that that was the reason it was so beautiful that it has to be true. <laughs> There's a lot of that in science. Like if something is beautiful enough, it's likely to be true. But that doesn't work for scientists because you only work in facts and approved facts and mediated facts and read through and agreed <clears throat> facts. But you're saying it was approved because it was just so beautiful. It was so beautiful. Well, it, it happens all the time, actually. So, the <laughs> <laughs> so having a background in theoretical physics, I, I was always fascinated by the beauty of formula or of a theory and the uh, uh, and that's so close to art and music because that, that's what you do as, 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 a, as, a, as a musician, as an artist. You can just be taken away by, 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 the, by the beauty of, of a certain melody, harmony, uh, chord progression, whatever, whatever it is. But, that, but being serious, the, I think it was very significant that the, uh, the, there was enough richness in, uh, in, in, the, in the models, enough elegance. You heard this word elegance in a lot in, uh, in physics and in science. More than you you might expect. There's a lot of weight uh, and and a, a lot of uh, of relevance uh, on things like beauty, elegance, and all these kind of attributes that you normally associate with with something that is artistic or creative. And sometimes, most of the times, if a theory uh, has elegance and beauty and is and and is is wonderful, is also true because you, know, you grow up with, with with this concept that nature is beautiful and is elegant. And it's wonderful, and and that of course resonates so much with, with who is, has also some some music background or some music or artistic background as well. And um, so this model was theorized in 1964, uh, and of course since then uh, scientists were constantly uh, proving pieces of it until the the very last piece of the jigsaw puzzle was the Higgs boson itself, that was like the foundation of the whole model, and that was this elusive particle that people can it couldn't really really find and and it was finally found by two experiments working together uh it was also a wonderful like, example of collaboration where uh, experiments had to stop competing with each other uh and uh, actually working uh, and it was w- wonderful because each experiment is different and so they were all so bringing different perspective and only by by putting together these perspectives that a new shape or a new vision could come could come out and the higgs boson was announced on the first of july 2012 at cern and there was a lot of data, of course. It was like like petabytes and petabytes of data. Like if if you could stack all the all the data in like uh, like CDs or DVDs, uh, you can go from the Earth to the to the Moon. Uh, and uh, it's, it's it's wonderful how how much work there was in uh, in extracting from that data the right things that you needed to prove the existence of the Higgs boson. So it was uh, too tempting for me not to not to try to get. <laughs> <laughs> what's a petabyte? We we all know gigabytes and terabytes. What's a petabyte? Oh, it's a it's a petabyte. Is a it's a one thousand gigabytes. So it's the next. <laughs> the one petabyte is a yeah. It's a thousand gigabytes. Oh, great! So, yeah. so you wrote a suite for flute and marimba based on yes. exposed some data. Yes, I and I I used different. Uh, it was it was a collection of uh, of data and the um, and the, the 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 idea was collecting data from the from the very beginning of the of search of the Higgs boson to the to finding it. Everything has happened between like starting searching for it until the uh, until we we finally found it. And uh, and there were 
there, there is a mix of things in uh, in in this suite. So in this last piece, this is the fourth movement of the of the suite, and uh, uh, and that is dedicated to the actual discovery. So that's why I I've, uh, I've chosen that one. And uh, and this collection of data from a, one particular experiment called CMS. And what we are hearing in uh, in in the piece are the energy spectra that physicists are measuring. It's like like the sound spectrum, but of course. You know, as a musician, we deal with sound. In uh, as physicists deal with energy, and uh, so they, they look at energy spectrum. And the and the energy spectrum is says you know, essentially if you uh, are likely to have created a Higgs boson or uh, or not. And finally, you have the right spectrum with the right shape uh, and the right uh, the right size. And so I wanted to capture that. I wanted to capture the um, the the richness of the uh, of the data that are and that we're describing. The, the Higgs boson peak and and spectrum, and converted that into into piece of music. So let's take a listen. And this is the project in collaboration with physicist and flute player, another another flutist that's a physicist. Yes. <laughs> Dr. Absolutely, Dr. Chiara Mar- Mariotti. Mariotti. So let's take a listen. took me on a little journey it was like simplicity to start with and it sort of drew me in so it was very different in construction to your the previous two excerpts that we listened to the flute and the marimba has this strange timbre when it's together doesn't it they, they do that they're, they're, they're so in some way they're so different and they're so complementary exactly yeah. like the like the different components that are part of an experiment or part of research you have you sometimes you start from different uh, different sides different sides of the knowledge or different sides of the, of the model and you start and you start working them out together and uh, and you're getting closer you're getting you're getting more and more interaction uh, and synergy between the different parts it's making making sense fascinating that you could take and this must have just been a small part of the data because you can you couldn't be analyzing <laughs> hundreds <laughs> of pet- petabytes of uh, data but if created a life to something as beautiful, as you say, as the Higboson. And interestingly, as physicists, you create theories and then you put them out there for other people to disprove. And then if nobody disproves it, you all come around eventually to accepting that perhaps it's right. The difference with music is there is no right or wrong, is there? There is just our interpretation. And we can interpret data in very different ways. Absolutely, we we can, and uh, and I think I think this is where where music is probably helping us to to bring the human side back into uh, into science. There, there is so much of the of us being human being with with our 
uh, our approach to things and our sensitivity and our our way of of dealing with complexity in science. We, sometimes we think about science as some as like number crunching. Like we we put we put the right numbers in the computer, uh, we wait enough time, and then we get the result. And uh, and it's so much not like that. That is so much of us being human and being that kind of wonderfully complex beings that we are. Uh, with our experience, so you have the same data, uh, and you have two diff- those two sciences coming from different parts of the world, with different, completely different experiences. They can they can bring up completely different conclusions, not necessarily competing, but having they they can see different things in that, and that's beautiful. And that's why 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 this this labs like third are international collaborations. They want the diversity. They need the diversity. Uh, they they need the the interaction of different people with different experiences to work together to bring that to use it, the the human side of uh, uh, of research in the best possible way and uh, and of, of course as a musician that's fascinating because we are we are constantly working on that how different individuals can and how different artists can can think about music structure organization and how we can interpret the piece or exactly the same the same piece you just just a, a scale can become a music piece can become a concert piece can become you can play very very quickly uh, repeatedly or can play extremely slowly or you can play in a, in a in a different in a very different ways and it can become a, a piece of music a very different piece of music is given to different different uh, music players it depends on the music instruments. It depends on the uh, on the background. A jazz musician would play it swinging, probably. Uh, a baroque musician would play it in a completely different way. Same with data, and we need that. We need a different perspective. We need individual angle, and that's what makes science so interesting and so close to music. And what I find fascinating is, say NASA came to you and said, "We've got data from the rover that's on Mars at the moment, and we would like you to." recreate this into music instead of using your imagination and doing a a composition based around what you can imagine you're actually actually taking real sounds real data and then creating this composition that is 50 percent real and 50 percent imagined or perhaps it's 90 percent real and just 10 percent imagined it is there's something quite magical and it comes over when you speak about science and you speak about data. You sort of break it down into sort of beauty, numbers of beauty. And as musicians, we're, we're sort of mathematicians as well, don't we? Because each piece we play has a, a pattern, has a mathematical equation within it. And you sort of break down this scary physics and desire to create beauty out of numbers for that i salute you sir oh thank you so much thank you for having me oh it do you know uh, we could keep on talking because there's so much so many areas that i would like to explore with you such as when you play one note on the flute for example and you put it through all your lab techniques how high and how low is the frequencies that you obviously we can't hear but what is the the actual spectrum of say a, a normal C flute? Yeah, the lowest and the highest harmonics, most of which are the, uh, the inaudible ones. Yes, exactly. So I- interestingly, there, there is there is quite a lot happening uh, below the actual the, the frequency of the let's say low C, uh, because it's the actual vibration vibration on, uh, of the flute that vibrates at the frequency that we, we cannot we cannot hear. There is most of it, of course. The biggest line in the spectrum is at the frequency we expect, the frequency of the, let's say, the C uh, of the flute. But there is a significant amount below that, and it's the actual body of the flute is, is vibrating. And of course, there are the harmonics of that that are that are all part of the uh, how the keys are actually built, what is the material of the keys. So this is how, how the different different materials are actually contributing. So why have why why I need, for example, like why a flute with a different mechanics. Like a pinless flute compared to a to a flute. why it makes a different sound because that mechanics of that vibration the entire flute vibrates and and the entire hundred percent of the, the of the of the of the flute is contributing to make the sound. It's not just the uh, the head joint or the uh, or the lip plate or the riser. It's the entire thing that vibrates and that makes every flute different. And and why makes I think flute making so fascinating because there is so 
much happening at every every level and everything is contributing to color the it's very very subtle sometimes but it's there it's tangible it's measurable do you think we should spend more time feeling the instrument rather than just blowing it should we sort of become one with our fingers on this tube that is vibrating i think see i i, th- I think we need me to embrace more that aspect it's more evident with an alto flute or a bass flute you can really feel it vibrating and one of the things i like about the having a flute with with, with open orcles for example is that you can you can really feel the vibration of the air under your finger is something so wonderful. And that, of course, is not just coloring the, fl- the, the, the sound and, the, and, of course, the endless discussion about how this, the sound changes. But for me as a musician, having the, a, a actual physical feeling of the air flowing under my feeling is so wonderful. And actually, and that makes my, my playing different. And I, I start tuning in the actual physical instrument and, uh, and my sound is different. Because I'm sure a lot of flute players that are listening to this, when they pick their instrument up, they put it together, blow through it, warm up, and then start playing. And don't have this relationship, this intimate relationship with this tube, this vibrating tube, the mass of which, as you've just said, and whatever the mass is contained, what materials contain within that mass, will affect the resonance, whether it's a gold flute with silver keys or whatever it is, that critical mass will be responsible for the, 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 the depth and the, the richness of the sound. But we don't, we just pick it up and play it. It's almost like a tool. And what you're saying is, to just take a step back a bit. Let's create this intimate relationship with this vibration, this tool, and then really begin to understand the note, that blob on the sheet of music. Listen to the depth of sound, play around with that, and then play around with the feel and the airstream. And if you do that, then suddenly music will come alive. Completely agree. It's such a, it's a mind, it's almost a mindful approach to to playing, like where you actually, you are, you are starting feeling the, the instrument as an instrument. So you are creating a connection that sometimes we we miss. We are we are so obsessed with. Okay, I need to get this practice done. I need to go to three scales, four pages, and I have to do that by. And I only have half an hour. I have to go to plow through this, and it's, we, we we sometimes we we are not connecting enough with our wonderful instruments. Just like we don't connect enough with beauty. One thing that the horrible 18 months has brought over to me was mm. being able to go outside and hear birds on the first lockdown <laughs> and not realising that I'd heard birds for a long time. But birds were there, but the sounds were just... They were hidden by this the sounds of traffic and aeroplanes. And sometimes the beauty... Mm. We, we walk past beauty all the time and we listen. As you said earlier, you know, when the beauty of, the, of our listening ear is being able to go within music and to hunt out little patches of beauty. And to understand that at its base level, it all comes back to one thing, data. And it's how we we look at that word data. You would look at it as beauty. Others would look at it as numbers. Some others would perhaps fall asleep. But data, you look at your bank statement, that's data. You can get so much emotion out of of that data. And we... Just because you say it's, it's in a shape that we can recognize as a musician, because it's a music score, we immediately connect that, and we l- immediately look beyond the numbers, and we look at the melody, we look at the beauty. So we, have, we, we, we look at beauty, and we, we perceive beauty uh, in data all the time as musicians. We just don't know that. Beauty, emotion, and data. Who would have thought those three words go together in the same sentence? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Dom, you're, you've been so kind this morning. Thank you very much for joining me on Zoom. You're as smiley and as excitable as I would never expect expected a scientist to be. But you've also put over the fact that scientists are not one-dimensional. Scientists, to be a true scientist, you've got to be you've, always, you've got to be artistic. You've got to be able to see beauty. You've got to be able to see colour. You've got to be able to see words because beauty and words come together. Because in different languages, whether it's Italian, French, Spanish, English, serbo Croat, Chinese, whatever it is, you will have a word and that word can then represent in a very limited way a piece of beauty. And so uh, you just you've you've completely demolished my visualization or my understanding of what a scientist actually looks like and speaks uh, like thank you so much I, I, i'll send you a couple of things uh and uh, and w- one of them is something that i did with scientists at cern they were also musicians 
and uh, it's a it's a it's a piece of music that I, I I've written taking data from the from the different experiments, and I had physicists of that experiments playing their own data. So I had Chiara playing flute and playing data from CMS. I had a clarinet player and violin player playing data from Atlas, data that they have collected. So they were like musicians, scientists, musicians were playing their own their own data in some in some way. In a, and I wanted them to be in like in a concert. Okay, so they actually dressed like a concert, so very formal, in the place where they collect the, the, the data. So it's underground next to their experiments. You see that, and they're actually playing uh, play flute or play violin, playing uh, playing clarinet or, or guitar in underground next to the experiment. They were playing their own sonification, their own, own melody, and then I put them together. So I wrote music in a way that. I was highlighting from different experiments pieces that where you play them together, you start hearing things that you, you couldn't hear before. And exactly like when you have a collaboration, we have we have different scientists that are each own, they are telling their own story and that story makes perfect sense. But it's only when you are bringing all this perception and these stories together that the bigger stories comes out. And so you can hear that when the, when the music, when all the fragments are put together, you listen to something different and you can hear the harmonies and you can hear the, the different uh, interactions between between them. I'll send you a little, say like two minutes YouTube video. I'll send you, I'll send you that. Oh, yes, yes, please. Um, do you know what? So you just said something really quite fascinating that, that music is telling a story. Obviously, it tells a story. You read a book, it tells a story. Science tells a story because science is always looking at something that's happened or is going to happen or is going to happen in the future oh. or is happening in this moment. So it's actually telling a story. Everything, music and science, is so, is so intrinsically linked. It, I, I believe, yeah, absolutely. And uh, if, I, if I can tell you one very last thing, I don't, I don't want, I want to, to take much, much, much of your time. There's, there's one thing I, very, I love very much, and, uh, and it's about Voyager, the spacecraft. Uh, it was launched in 1977. Mm. Uh, it's still there, you know, outside the solar system. And the um, and there are a few instruments like detectors that are still switched on from 1977 to now. One of them is is detecting the magnetic field, and the other one is detecting the uh, the plasma. So the the, the amount of, of particles that are hitting the the, the, the spacecraft. Uh, and I've took uh, I, I did this project with NASA where we, we took data from 1977 to well two years ago when the project was, and I put them into a story. Like I took data uh, every, so there were data every day, and I took let's say one note every day for more than forty years, uh, and the and the idea was that I was then uh, extracting fragments that were that were sounding particularly nice, and uh, and using music I created a very short like two minutes piece of music, where I used a the entire story of the of the spacecraft starting from the earth receiving jupiter then going to uranus and leaving the solar system and you can hear that music changes completely you can hear that the the range of notes is different so the pitch is different you can hear the big jump where the uh where the magnetic field changes completely when it goes outside the, the spacecraft went outside the solar system uh and um and I orchestrated that, uh, and of course, this orchestration was reflecting, reflecting that. So it, it, it fits like a bit like film, like film scoring. This was my my background, and uh, uh, and uh, but it's beautiful because I, I normally play this this piece with people in the audience. Say, you are telling me when the spacecraft is leaving the solar system. <laughs> I'm not telling you. Listen to the music. Close your eyes. It's trying to to be there with the spacecraft in this journey, in this story. Let the music tell you a story, and you raise your hand or. or you tell me when you feel that spacecraft, the music is exchanged so dramatically. Was it sad when Voyager left the solar system or was it exciting? How would the science of scientists have felt with that beautiful spacecraft that is so old and it's still working, exiting what we regard as our solar system? I, I think it's a, it's a mix of the two and it, it's... <laughs> And they are so con connected that is tangible sadness and tangible ex excitement. You feel that okay, this is now in a completely different part. No, no, nothing and any, anything, anybody has been there before. It's a part of the universe we never explored in any possible way. Uh, so this, the, the, the excitement of getting information in a, from a, a place of the universe we never had any information from. Of dark information from other than, of course, radio astronomy. 
Uh, and but there's also the sadness that we, in some way, this thing left home for good, mm. like left the solar system, and uh, and it's now somewhere else. But we have data. Well, we have power in the uh, for at least fifteen more, at least fifteen years. So far away that the data takes a day to go back to Earth. Just uh, at the speed of light is so. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's mind-boggling yet beautiful in its purity. It's just oh. it's just it's wonderful. Oh, you uh, let well, we let we have to do this again. But again, I'm going to come to Cambridge and do it on your turf. Please, I, I please, I haven't please. been to Cambridge for a few years, so uh, I will come and uh, let's do it on your patch and let's delve down into the sort of the fundamentals of us as musicians and how we can utilize data mm. and science to improve ourselves. Because as players, yes, absolutely, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much, Don, for coming on to Talking Flutes. May your week ahead be musically fulfilling and may your top C be especially, I know it's quite hard, in tune. Goodbye all. Talking Flutes and Talking Flutes Extra are podcast productions by the Trevor James Flute Company. For more information, visit trevorjamesflutes.com.